If you missed the previous part of this series, it covered the first four layers of the iceberg and contained all of the useful explanations of what iceberg charts are, credits for this particular iceberg, shout out again to Ave Lux Claritatis, who was very nice to me on Reddit and who made this iceberg, and also some generalized info on methods of decoding cryptograms and ciphers. Uh, I'm gonna presume you either watched the last part or are already familiar with this sort of stuff, because I may reference some of the things mentioned in the last video without explanation in this one. So that said, I think we can go ahead and get right into the last part of this iceberg. Tier 5. We're starting to get much more obscure now, with only a few of these being likely known to anyone who isn't already particularly interested in this field or in mysterious things in general. Untersberg Code The Untersberg is a massive, which is a geological feature that isn't a mountain in itself, but it may refer to a group of mountains, which is the case here, on the border of Berkvesgaden, Germany, and Salzburg, Austria. One of the mountains in this massive is the site of the deepest cave in the world, the Resending Cave, and it is an absolutely fascinating place with a very fascinating cave rescue story as well. This entry is probably not about Resending Cave, but who knows, it could have been. The cave that this code was found in wasn't documented, but it's said that a man named Lazarus found an inscription on a cave wall several hundred years ago. Interestingly, this isn't known from second or third hand accounts, but from Lazarus himself, who documented his findings. Those writings survived until today and are stored at the Salzburg Museum. And although the manuscript isn't a part of the digital archives as far as I could tell, I did find a few digital archives that made reference to it. However, this made me very unsure as to the actual date of the discovery of this code and the writings about it. A few places I had looked at about this code said the discovery was in the 1500s. The museum archives indicate a much later date in the late 1600s to early 1700s. It's possible I'm conflating records, but considering the directory codes matched up, I think these are the right ones, so I'm not entirely sure what the date is here. But date of discovery aside, the manuscript contains several illustrations, one of which contains an unknown cipher. It looks to be written in the Roman alphabet with Arabic numerals, but it differs from the rest of the writing around it as it's broken up by periods after several letters, perhaps indicating breaks in words. It doesn't seem that any real dedicated work on analyzing this potential code has been done, and with how much unclear information seems to be surrounding it, there may be an added factor of misinformation or misinterpretation. However, if you're familiar with Old German or other languages that might have been in use in that time and place, such as Latin, then you might take a shot at this one and see what you can find. Karakwakopa Cryptograms For a fun little mystery, we enter a world I'd never heard of, the world of encrypted newspaper ads. Apparently this was quite common for a time in England, and there's a whole book about these ads and how to solve them. However, there are several that are still mysteries. Ignatius Poloki, who we will come back to again later, became a highly successful private detective while living in England in the second part of the 19th century. He was fond of sending these sorts of encrypted ads. Some of his ads will show up again in another entry, but for now we're just going to focus on a pair of them, both from May of 1875. The first ad was from May 8th, followed up by a second, longer ad on May 20th, and this latter ad included a few sentences in clear text, explaining that the ad on the 8th could be solved when used in conjunction with the ad from the 20th. Because some of the words in the ads were suspiciously pronounceable instead of just massive jumbles of letters, Klaus Schme of scienceblogs.de, a cryptographer and cryptologist who is also an author, did a frequency letter analysis, suspecting a transposition cipher instead of a substitution cipher. In a transposition cipher, characters in a text are moved around in a particular pattern to basically create giant anagrams. This is in contrast to a substitution cipher where particular characters are replaced with other characters, and when you do that, it often destroys the amount of vowels you have. When you then look at a letter frequency analysis, you can kind of figure out what should have been a vowel, but the amount of vowels don't stay consistent. However, in this case, the letter distribution for the vowels was very consistent with what you'd expect of English. When combined with the other most common letters being consonants like S that are used very, very often, and in English, it does suggest that this is a transposition cipher of some sort, although it doesn't rule out that other methods were also used. Discussion in the comments of Klaus's article also produced a few words that may be part of the decryption, and I saw mention of a potential third ad in this set, but as far as I can tell, these are all still unsolved. Cigarette Case Cipher this is a neat little mystery here regarding a cigarette case inherited from the owner's father and which apparently had been in the family for a few generations. The case is silver, monogrammed with AS on the front, and has a maker stamp from Germany. The inside of the case has an engraved message written in code, but with a presumably clear text date of December 24th, 1909. The periods, or potentially the forward slashes, are likely word separators, and because this is a short code written in what was likely a present, this may be a relatively simple code that could be quickly translated if the right person makes an attempt. Silob Cryptogram In 2007, a musician named Chris Jeffs, who is known by his stage name of DJ Silob, recounted an experience he had in the mid-90s. 
In this story, he says he went to a bookstore in London and found a pile of free brochures available near the front door. An employee at the store told him that they were left there by a mysterious person, but she didn't know anything else about them. The booklet and the strange set of images within it are the basis of this entry. It consists of 20 pages, some with drawings of what looks like cameras as well as targets, and most strangely, many little rectangles that have different features such as lines or colored in boxes. These are what are believed to make up the potential code. There are 24 different rectangles, although a few of them only show up at the beginning and ends of the brochure. However, it's worth noting that there are also smaller versions of the rectangles that show up in the diagram boxes, which are similar but not identical to the main 24. It's not clear whether they're simplified versions or if they should be considered completely separate letters. There's also one simple written in red in the last page and at a diagonal, almost like a signature stamp. Although I am very suspicious about this origin story, considering that it lines up nicely with just about every other attempt to start an ARG that has ever existed, the puzzle itself is still very interesting. It's been speculated that this might be an old manual for a board game or a game accessory or even some sort of intelligence test. To me, it kind of looks like a setup or wiring diagram almost for a camera or some other piece of technological equipment, and it kind of gives me flashbacks to using LabVIEW in college. Don't use LabVIEW. LabVIEW is terrible. Uh, neat puzzle though, and one with a little bit of starting work done on it for anyone interested in taking a look. LCS 35 Challenge. This is a short one because I refuse to take both the time to be sure I totally understand and can accurately explain math. But basically, Ronald L. Rivest designed a little bit of a troll puzzle based on a mathematical equation expected to take 35 years to solve using normal numerical computation. He even accounted for the exponential growth of technology. The puzzle itself is an equation. W equals 2 to the power of 2 to the power of t modulus n. T and N are both given. Additionally, a value called Z is given, and the final result of W is supposed to be compared with Z to produce the final result, which is a message about how to factor N. Because of how large the starting values are, how quickly exponential calculations get enormous, and the fact that the calculations need to be done sequentially and build upon themselves, the calculation itself was suggested to take 35 years to solve. The solution will be announced in 2033, or when the solution is found and verified, whichever comes first. Kula cryptograms. David Kahn, a historian and journalist, is one of the preeminent researchers of cryptology. In 1981, he published five unsolved codes taken from a German outpost used by spies in World War II. Kula was a spy stationed in America who sent these five messages back to the outpost. Each message is numbered with its number of characters and broken up into words of five letters each, except for the last word, which can be any length. The codes seem to have been mostly forgotten about with very little discussion. Most of the recent interest seems to be on Klaus Schmidt's post about the topic, including a comment from February of this year claiming to have solved the messages, but without much detail on the method other than it's a substitution cipher. The solutions were given in English rather than German, but it's presumably a translation since the number of characters that the messages should have don't match up, but it's very hard overall to say how accurate these solutions might be. ADFGVX ciphers. Continuing with the theme of Germans and world wars, this entry comes from World War I this time. The German army used different types of ciphers during the war, but one in particular was called ADFGVX, with these letters chosen because they're all distinct in Morse code. To use the cipher, a grid was set up with the letters across the rows and the columns, and the empty squares were filled in with letters and numbers based on a code word. Then the message was encoded into positions, such as AA or DG, depending on where they fell in the grid, and rearranged once more based on another code word. This produced a pretty nicely jumbled message without knowing the code words, but these codes could still be solved and the method to do so was discovered by French Army Lieutenant Georges Painvin. Working backward using letter frequency analysis and index of coincidence, along with other tricks and clever observations, he was able to sort out which letters went into which positions and then translate them back to their correct plain text. Then they could be unscrambled to reveal the message. Although many of the messages have been decoded this way, there are still many left unsolved, hence the entry for this iceberg. World War II Bullet Cryptograms the story from this one goes that Italian metal detectorists, searching in South Tuscany in likely late 2014 or early 2015, found an old bullet casing with a small note hidden inside. Like the last few entries, this message also has words consisting of five letters, although the first and last lines differ from that pattern. The date is also written as August 13th, 1944, month first, indicating it was likely American. According to a forum thread discussing the discovery, it was also suggested that the bullet case itself was American, lending to this theory. Of course, this same forum thread also produced 
produced an obviously fake translation that was then picked up and shared in different articles on the subject. So take information with a grain of salt. The fake translation repeated a joke so old and so common that even I had heard it before regarding Germans not knowing how to pull the pins of their grenades before throwing them so the Allied army could just throw them back. But as for a real decryption, there doesn't seem to have been any real progress made on it. It's theorized that it may have been encrypted with a field cipher, and so it may be very hard to break without knowing which field cipher it was. Chinese gold bar cryptograms. This is a weird one. <laughs> The story goes that the International Association for Cryptologic Research was contacted by the curator of a museum telling them of a mysterious set of gold bars. These gold bars were from China, made in 1933, and supposedly detailed a bank deposit made to a U.S. bank. The gold bars are covered in pictures and inscriptions, and although the Chinese characters have been translated and talk about the bank deposit, the other inscriptions are undeciphered. And that, it seems, is everything known about these gold bars. And if you're having flashbacks to the Beale Papers entry and how convenient it was that the only readable portion of the mysterious text has to do with how much money is involved, you are, once again, not the only one. Although it's not impossible that the story and the gold bars themselves could be real, there are so many red flags in the story that it's impossible not to consider it a likely hoax. From the unverifiable origin, no museum being named as the source of information, the somewhat anachronistic image of a plane printed on the gold bars, the outdated contact info for those listed as contacts for this mystery, the difficulty of making gold bars with such complex markings that would have held up for at least 70 years, and so many more little issues, it is likely that there is something amiss here. However, if you would like to take a look at the ciphers, there are detailed images of the bars as well as transcriptions available for anyone attempting to solve them. Maybe there's something there after all, and maybe you'll find it. Tier 6. Entries on this tier really range in their natures and origins, but are getting more and more mysterious as we go. Blitz ciphers. For this entry, the story goes that, just after World War II, a box of papers was found in a damaged wall in London. Many years later, in 2011, the nephew of the original finder sent images of several of the pages to Nick Pelling of CypherMysteries.com. Although only three were sent at first, five more were later sent in 2014, for a grand total of eight. The pages are very striking, written in a pretty calligraphic style with what seems to be brown ink on stained homemade paper. In addition to the main writing, there are segments of what appear to be annotations, written in a much smaller size with darker ink. The alphabet seems to be approximately 50 symbols, and many of the characters themselves are recognizable. Many are astronomical, alchemical, Greek, or Roman. Some also appear, at least to me, to be reminiscent of Sanskrit or even Japanese katakana, though of course a lot of these symbols are also basic shapes that could easily be made up by someone entirely unaware of these languages. Letter frequency analysis does indicate that some letters are more common than others, but with how many characters there are, it's unlikely this is a simple substitution. However, many other types of cipher are possibilities, from homophonic to null characters to abbreviations or symbols used to represent entire words. It's also unknown what language it might decode to, but English, German, and Latin are considered the most likely. It is also always possible this is a hoax. The fantastical story, the huge delay between releasing pieces, the suspiciously dramatic staining of the paper in artsy patterns, the yet somehow don't actually render pages unreadable and don't match from page to page, the extremely common and mystical symbols chosen for the cipher, they're all reasons for some skepticism. That said, even if it is a hoax, it's a very elegant and very pretty one, and as long as it's solvable, it might well be worth it just for the challenge. Pigeon NURP40TW194 Continuing with World War II for this one, in 2012, the body of a pigeon was found in the UK, but this wasn't just any pigeon. Known as 40TW194, this was a carrier pigeon with the National Union of Racing Pigeons, and this pigeon had been carrying a coded message from France, believed to have been written and sent during the D-Day invasion. The message might look a little familiar at this point, showing a set of words that are each five letters except for the last two. In fact, to me, this looks a lot like the bullet code from Tier 6, right down to the final word having a forward slash followed by two characters to end out the message. Since both messages were from the same war and likely encoded using codebooks, it's probably no surprise that they're similar in format. However, without the codebooks used, it's believed that it's not really possible to truly decode this message. Even if it is, with how short it is, it would be very difficult to verify the result. Bonus 22 challenge. In World War II, one of the methods of doing field encoding was using a machine called the M209. It's more complicated than the cipher wheel covered in an earlier entry, but uses a very similar idea. Multiple wheels, each with a number of letters printed on it, which would then encode any message into different letters, which could then be decrypted by anyone with an M209 and the three keys used to encode the message. The three keys were basically just different settings that could be changed that would affect which letters the machine would choose in place of the original clear text letters. 
The M209 was not particularly secure, but this wasn't considered a huge drawback since it was only used for messages that would be quickly outdated, and so by the time that anyone could decode them, they'd no longer be valuable. But since they're relatively simple to decode, there are many examples of solved messages and challenges for code breakers to practice on. 40 of these challenges were posted on the website of Jean-Francois Bouchaudy, including 12 main challenges and 28 bonus challenges. All but one of the bonus challenges have been solved, but bonus challenge 22 still remains undefeated. Bonus 22 is a series of messages, including two that are encoded with the same key. I did see a comment claiming to have solved the puzzle, but no proof and no indication that an answer had been accepted, so as far as I can tell, this challenge still remains unsolved. Sufi Fiddle Mystery In a book called The Sufi Fiddle, author and professor of Middle Eastern history at Columbia University, Robert Bullet tells a story of a violin with an inscription in an unknown language. Bullet states that although the story is fiction, the violin and its inscription are not. He claims that the violin was found in Boston in 1968, and that at least the inscription was passed around amongst Harvard professors for some time before Bullet wrote his book. The inscription itself appears to be an Arabic script, though many languages use the script or variations of it, and so narrowing it down to a specific language has been a challenge. Bullet suggested it might be Maranao, a language from the Philippines that is now sometimes written in Roman letters, but has historically been written in the Arabic or Jawi scripts. And if so, that would make this a matter of linguistics rather than any sort of code. Personally, I looked into this one a little bit, and I think the idea that it's Jawi script is the strongest, but I can't be too completely confident of my identification. It's also important to remember that whoever transcribed the writing, who, if I'm reading the signature right, is named J. Castle Winter, was probably copying the script down to the best of their ability, but may or may not have been totally accurate if they didn't speak the language or weren't used to writing these characters. But whether it's Jawi script or Arabic or something else, and whether it's Marino or another language, this might be a mystery you could help solve if you happen to have the right knowledge. Unsolved Nomenclatures Nomenclatures are a type of code that is very simple in format, but depending on how they've been constructed, can be very difficult to crack. Numbers are chosen to represent letters, potentially pairs of letters, and sometimes potentially common words. They can also include null characters, can represent multiple letters with the same number, or vice versa, and words represented by the numbers could either be spelled out or written with a specific number designated just to them. The more possible variations, the better the encryption, and so these codes can range from extremely simple to very difficult. There are countless unsolved nomenclatures, any of which might pose an interesting challenge. Silk Dress Cryptogram. This entry has such a classic mysterious code feeling to me, but in a good way. In 2014, costumer, curator, and collector Sarah Rivers Cofield bought a bronze silk dress likely from the 1880s. As she worked on analyzing and taking stock of the condition of the dress, she located an unusually hidden pocket in the skirt. And then within that, two pages of handwritten notes. Even better, the notes were written in code. Unlike many of the codes covered so far, this one has many recognizable words, and actually sounds a little bit like the Markovian parallax denigrate, in that it's seemingly random but intelligible words all smooshed together. It seems that the reason for this is that this was a popular method of writing code at the time, based on code books that were available to the public, used for sending encoded telegrams by finding the desired word in a code book and then replacing it with the code book's substitution. Codebooks were popular and easily available at the time of the dress's believed creation, and many of the words and even short phrases from the notes match up with known codebooks from the time. Unfortunately, the issue with solving this code is that finding the correct codebook for it might be a challenge. There were so many available at the time. However, if someone is able to track down the right book, it should be possible to easily decode the message. MLH Cryptogram a short but mysterious entry, around 1976, a young man disappeared without a trace, though it was believed he'd left home on his own. He had no contact with his parents until a note presumed to have written by him was delivered to their home, but aside from addressing his mother by her initials, MLH, the note was entirely in code. The code itself is made up of symbols, many of which are relatively simple or recognizable, such as the delta and the circle with a dot that represents the sun. It's not particularly long, only about 30 characters, which makes it very difficult to decode using traditional methods. The writer's experience in computer programming, as well as interests that include astrology, might factor into his choice of symbols or even the method of encoding. Unfortunately, the code has never been solved, and it seems that the writer has not contacted his parents again since. Harry Carolyn slash Tissy Jabber messages. In a similar vein to the earlier entry about encoded ads from Victorian England, in March 1863, a pair of ads ran in the London newspaper The Evening Standard. The first was from someone who signed their name as Harry to someone named Caroline, and the second was from Caroline in response a few days later. 
Both messages were short, about two to three sentences each, with short words of jumbled letters. Z, X, W, and V show up at least a few times in each message, and considering they are relatively rare letters in terms of letter frequency normally, they might give some indication of what kind of encoding was used. However, these messages have never been solved. A similar pair of short messages ran in a different newspaper, the Daily Mail, a few decades later in September 1901. These were between people who signed their names as Jabber and Tissy, and each are a single sentence of several words, with each words being four letters and predominantly made up of Ds. Although a few theories have been proposed, such as the messages being about horse betting, these messages also remain unsolved. Pollocky cryptograms. So, still on the Victorian England train here. Remember the other ads we had talked about before, the Cataclacopa cryptograms? This is the continuation, looking at the other two unsolved messages sent by private detective Ignatius Pollocki. The first was sent in 1865 and is partially in clear text, but with the middle portion of the message written in symbols, made up of dots, lines, and curves similar to parentheses. It also seems that the name of the person being addressed to is written in this code, and the clear text says that the addressee's message was received in time for whatever the encoded message is, and that Polaki would return to England in mid-June. The second ad was sent in 1871 and is written in numbers, with each word generally broken up by periods, but some breaking patterns by including equal signs, colons, and even what seems to be a blank word. The only clear text is the word telegram at the start, and then Polaki's signature and address at the end. Neither of these ciphers has had much progress made, so they are still unsolved as well. The Drolotic Dreams of Pantagruel A bit of a different sort of cryptogram here, as this is more of an art history mystery than a code or an indecipherable language. The puzzle here is more about what the images were meant to represent and say metaphorically rather than how to translate them into words. The publisher was Richard Breton, an illustrator and bookbinder from France. The book was published in 1565 and features 120 pages of woodcut images, each of highly stylized creatures or beings in a variety of clothes, poses, and scenes. The general style of the illustrations draw from other prominent artists of the time, particularly Francois Rubelet, who Breton had previously worked with and who was implied to have drawn the illustrations in this book. However, it is now believed that Breton's partner, Francois Depré, was likely the one who created these works. The book had a great influence in popular culture at the time, helping to bring attention to Rabelais' previous work and was an inspiration for some English masks. The meanings and interpretations of the many illustrations are still a point of discussion in modern day, and I highly suggest taking a look at them. They are all very unique and fascinating in an incredibly weird and yet also kind of endearing sort of way. Jabron Cryptogram. Jabron is a river in France, but also refers to a very tiny town near that river. It's near this town, or more specifically, between this town and another small town called Les Bourges, that there's a place called Le Pont de Levesque, which I am sure I mangled and I'm sorry. This is where, scratched into a stone on the cliffside, a mysterious encoded inscription exists that might have been written by, wait for it, the Knights Templar. Yes, we finally got there. Somebody called the History Channel. We got Templars. But no, really. The connection to the Templars seems dubious and circumstantial at best, but the author of a 1972 book that details this mystery, L'Ile des Veurs by Alfred Weissel, makes a case for it. This is mostly based on historical accounts of Templar activity in the area, but he also claims to have been able to translate the cryptogram itself, which supposedly contains some religious wording that indicates it's related to the Templars. I'll put Weissel's French solution to the cryptogram, as well as the Google Translate version up on the screen. On the off chance y'all haven't realized it by my terrible pronunciation so far, I'm not familiar with French, so you can decide for yourself how accurate the translation is. But whether or not this is related to Templars, it does seem to be a mysterious cryptogram carved into a rock, which itself is very cool and warrants further research. However, without better images, it's very difficult to get a good enough sense of the symbols to be confident of any work done on it. Tier 7. Nearing the bottom of the iceberg now, these entries are very obscure, but range in origin, method of encryption, and the amount of work done on them. Urquhart's Encrypted Poems Thomas Urquhart was a Scottish writer and poet living in the 1600s who published several original works as well as a widely acclaimed translation of the first three books of Francois Rubelais. I love how these all kind of start to tie together. Amongst his large collection of writing were two poems written in code. The first is two lines, made up of one to two digit numbers separated by periods. The second is much longer, being eight lines, and the numbers varying from one to three digits and separated by spaces. Although only a transcription seems to be available instead of the original source, so it's unclear if the formatting is accurate. Both poems appear to be nomenclatures, and since the second is of decent length, the chance of breaking it with some time and effort is pretty good. If both poems happen to be encoded the same way, then decoding one of them might make it possible to read the other as well. Ferdinand III's Secret Script 
Ferdinand III held several titles in several countries, the last of which being the Holy Roman Emperor, which he held from 1637 to 1657. It was during that time that he wrote two encrypted letters, one to his brother Leopold Wilhelm and another to an unknown person. Both letters are written in similar styles, perhaps even using the same cipher, and are a mix of clear text and encoded passages. The cipher uses a combination of symbols and numbers, with about 27 symbols total. But as it turns out, there is actually no need to wonder about this cipher. It seems it was solved only a week after Klaus Schmidt posted an article on it. Philologist and historian Professor Thomas Ernst, who is renowned for breaking other historical ciphers, figured out the key to Ferdinand III's ciphers and was able to decode them. He posted comments to Klaus's article as he worked on the puzzle, giving interesting insight into the process, and then later published a paper on the subject. If you're interested and can read German, I have the paper linked in the description where you can learn all about the method and the solution. SS Lippert Radio Message this is a short one since there's just so little known about it. A German officer during World War II received a coded message made up of six lines, each line broken into two words, and the words written in letters, numbers, or a mix of both. Some of the words are separated by equal signs, others with slashes or colons. Although a few suggestions have been proposed, including that the word ALAP stands for Hungary, I think based after a small town in Hungary, it doesn't seem to have any real solution which has been found. With how short this message is, and the fact that it really doesn't follow any known German enciphering methods of the time, it's unclear just how much potential there is for decoding this one. Erba Murder Cryptogram in 2006, in the city of Araba in Italy, a husband and wife murdered four neighbors in an absolutely unhinged attack, particularly since one of the victims was only two years old. The married couple, Alinda Romano and Rosa Bazzi, were convicted and sentenced to life in prison. However, before their convictions, Alinda was somehow able to send his wife encoded messages, despite them being in separate jails. Unfortunately, it is very unclear just how many messages were sent and how much more encrypted writing Alinda was responsible for that might not have been sent. What we do know is that some of the messages were easily decoded, and were used by the police as evidence in court, with the information at some point released to the public, but it seems to have disappeared from the internet. This entry, however, refers to a particularly decorative page that seemed to have been hidden in a Bible, and is a mixture of handwriting, drawn images of what might be clovers, and illustrations that have been pasted in, kind of like a collage. The script itself is in letters and dashes, seemingly without any spaces to separate words, and is likely a substitution cipher of some sort. Since Alindo's other codes were apparently easily broken before, this one's unlikely to be particularly complicated and could probably be cracked by someone who takes some time to work on it. Copenhagen Cryptogram the Copenhagen cryptogram is a mysterious little code that was discovered in Copenhagen, Denmark, likely in the late 1950s. It was found on a piece of paper on the back of a painting from 1835, but it's unclear whether the paper is that old or if it was just added at some point between 1835 and its discovery around the 1950s. Based on the style of handwriting, it's likely more modern. The code contains 25 different symbols, which indicates a likely substitution cipher, since the Danish alphabet has 29 letters and it's common not to need all of them. The symbols themselves are a mixture of letters, numbers, and simple characters such as slashes with dots next to them, or triangles missing their bases. Little work seems to have actually been done on this other than letter frequency analysis, and so this code remains a mystery in many ways. Goldbug Variations Cryptogram The Goldbug Variations is a 1991 novel written by author Richard Powers, following two separate but interconnected stories taking place at different periods of time. One of the themes is to work to understand the genetic code, which makes it fitting that this book contains a code of its own. The dedications page of the Goldbug Variations is a set of 32 words, each word being three letters, with some words having a question mark in the place of the middle letter. An article written by J.T. Thomas in 2006 proposes a simple but, in my opinion, very elegant explanation. This code is simply made up of names, represented only by their initials, and where the middle names were unknown, they were given question marks. This would, in a way, fit with the theme of the book and the discussion of breaking down genes, which make up a person, into codes. In genetics, three-letter words called codons are often used, and this also matches the format of the dedications page code. However, if this is the solution, it would be very difficult to prove and even more difficult to decode, and other potential explanations are still possible. Kaliningrad Bottle Post In 2015, in Kaliningrad, Russia, Workers installing a gas line found a small bottle mixed in with the dirt that they had brought up in their backhoe. This wasn't unusual, as unfortunately litter is common all over the world, but there was something about this bottle that caught the workers' attention. This bottle was sealed with a cork. Curious, the workers broke it open and found a note, but it wasn't just any note, it seemed to have been written in code. The handwriting is neat and done in blue ink, 
written in Roman letters with variant accent marks and apostrophes. It's difficult to say whether the apostrophes are combined with letters to create new symbols, if the apostrophes are meant to mark grammar, accent, or other similar modifications, or something else. Letter frequency analysis and index of coincidence indicate that the original language may have been Russian, but German is also proposed as a likely alternative since Kaliningrad used to be Konigsberg, an East German city. If it is Russian, then decoding would likely result in Cyrillic, which is the alphabet Russian is typically written in. Thomas Ernst, who we mentioned a few entries ago, commented on Klaus's article about the topic that he had solved this one and it's indeed Cyrillic, but I couldn't find a finished write-up of the result or any solution given. Another commenter also says they've cracked it and that it's part of a Bible chapter, but again there was no proof. So it is possible that this one is solved, however it's possible there's still work remaining to be done. Moustier Altar Inscriptions in Belgium, there's a village called Moustia, which is the site of a historical church called St. Martin's Church. Within this church is the reason for this entry. Two altars, each inscribed with an encoded message. One altar is for St. Mary, the other for St. Martin. It's unknown when the two altars were created, but the church itself existed at least as early as 1836, when records indicate it was worn down and in need of repairs, meaning it was likely much older than this. An altar to St. Martin was sold in 1843 by the nearby village of Basclis, and it's possible that this was the same one that is now in Moustier, but this is only speculation. The messages on both altars are very similar in format and likely enciphered the same way. They are written in a combination of Roman and Greek letters, primarily Roman with Greek lambda and gamma being clearly written a few times, but there are also a few letters that appear to be combinations of other letters such as H and P. Because of these little quirks and the uneven sizes of some of the inscriptions, it's difficult to produce an accurate letter frequency analysis. Although work has definitely been done on the messages, even by the NSA, no solution seems to have been found just yet. Roosevelt Cryptogram in 1935, an anonymous encrypted letter was sent to then-President Franklin D. Roosevelt. This letter is in two different parts, the first part being a series of numbers and apostrophes, the second being a short encrypted message written in letters, followed by English clear text which says, or else you die, with a cute little skull and crossbones that I can only imagine is saying, yar. The message in letters is very simple and can be read without even writing anything down. All you do is start at the second letter and read every other letter until you get to the end, then start at the second to last letter and do the same thing going to the left. So the result is, did you ever bite a lemon? Which is not exactly ominous, just weird. There have been some theories proposed over time for what this means, including a folk remedy for an illness that Roosevelt might have had, but no clear explanation. The numerical cipher has never been solved and may not be a cipher at all, as the entire message seems kind of like a prank. However, it's hard to prove a negative, and so unless the message is deciphered in the future, then this might remain a mystery. Train Station Robbery Cryptogram In 1916, a man robbed a train ticket counter in Ohio. He ran off with $265, approximately $7,300 today, but left behind a note written in code. It's unclear how the note and the robbery were related, and in fact, they probably weren't. The prevailing theory is that this is an encrypted telegram, much like the silk dress cryptogram we talked about earlier, likely done through use of a codebook. Unfortunately, we have the same problem here with this cryptogram. If it is a codebook, it's unlikely that it could be solved without the matching book. Though anyone who happens to have codebooks from the 1916s might want to take a look. Maybe they can figure this one out. Rilke Cryptogram This entry is about an interesting find made in the 1942 edition of Rainier Maria Rilke, originally published in 1928 by author Gert Brochet. I tried to get an idea of what it was about, but my best guess is that it was a biography, since Rainier Marie Rilke was a writer and poet from Austria who had died in 1926. But the book itself really isn't the important part of this entry. It's what was pasted into the blank parts of its pages, lines and lines of what seemed to be code. The code is made up of words of four letters long, mostly in letters and numbers, including accented letters. What these pages mean, why they were hidden, and if they're even code at all, are subjects of debate. In addition to being perhaps secret code, it's been suggested that these are simply training exercises for learning Morse code, and that they were stored in the book for practical reasons. Tier 8 We've reached the last tier, and as is fitting for the depths of the ocean, some of these get weird. Double Column Transposition Reloaded A double columnar transposition is a method of encryption used during the Cold War, and in many ways is similar to the ADFGVX setup but it's simpler to do. A keyword of any length is chosen, and each letter of it becomes the header of a column. The clear text is then arranged beneath it, each letter to a column, wrapping around as it exceeds the length of the keyword. Once the columns are arranged, the keyword is put into alphabetical order, which scrambles the clear text. Then you read the columns top to bottom, left to right, to produce the first transposition. Pick another keyword and do the whole thing over, and you have a double columnar transposition. Because the keys can be a word of any length, reverse engineering the keys so as to undo the cipher is exceptionally difficult. 
The text itself is much more accessible, and since it's basically a giant anagram, it's susceptible to the methods of analysis that focus on unscrambling the message, as well as typical tools such as letter frequency. Although, due to scrambling, index of coincidence would have inherent issues. In 2007, Klaus Schmidt published a challenge double column transposition cipher in his book, Codenaka Geigen Codemaka, as well as online. In 2013, the challenge was solved by George Lasry, a cryptographer and computer scientist from Israel. He broke the cipher by focusing on the encoded text, developing two different methods to do so. The paper on the subject is unfortunately paywalled, so I wasn't able to read in too depth on the method, but from what I understand, at least one of the methods was a simple dictionary attack. This method takes dictionary words and tries them until it finds a match, and in this case, since the clear text was taken from a published book, this method worked. Different methods of unscrambling the anagram were found until it matched a set of words from a known source. With this challenge cipher broken, Klaus decided that there needed to be not one, but three new challenges of the same type, and he called them Double Column Transposition Reloaded. This time, the clear text was original writing rather than taken from a source, eliminating the ability to easily match to an existing source. Some information has been given as hints for the third of these ciphers, such as the length of the keys and that the clear text is in German, but the cipher and its companions are still unsolved. Forgotten Languages, ARG. Forgotten Languages is a website that is a wild, wild ride, but in a good way. It's a massive project, dating back to 2008 or so and still ongoing, and is made up of many, many articles, each written in an unknown conlang. Conlangs are created languages, languages made up by somebody as an individual or as a group, rather than a naturally developed language over time. These languages all seem to have been created for the Forgotten Languages project, and are presumably self-consistent throughout, though that's difficult to verify if you don't speak the language. Although many articles are written entirely in these unknown languages, some have intelligible titles, and others might use quotes or words from known languages, or, seemingly, incorporate words from other languages into their own, just as known languages acquire new vocabulary from other known languages. The topics of the articles themselves seem to vary from computer science to genetics to language to sociology to astrophysics, and most articles have a length of sources, including some linking back to other Forgotten Languages articles. I did look at a kind of random assortment of selected sources, and they were all real, so I have no reason to link that the rest of the bibliographies aren't real as well. When it comes to deciphering a conlang, it's a linguistic analysis more than a code-breaking one. As far as I know, none of the forgotten languages have been translated, but with at least some of the languages using and incorporating known languages into them, and with the topics being written about being known, there's a good chance to at least get the gist of some of these articles, and therefore get the gist of some of the languages. Considering this project incorporates several subjects I've studied and am interested in, I might have to return to this one for a deep dive, and I highly suggest anyone interested in this entry to go check out the website. Sodalitis Fulturus Volantis. Sodalitis Fulturus Volantis reminds me a lot of classic but expansive internet mysteries that walk the line between ARG and art project, but with just enough mystery to make you wonder if they might be something more. But whatever the intention behind this one might be, there is definitely mystery to be found. Although more of this site is in clear text English than the previous entry, there are plenty of different languages and codes scattered about. Just on the FAQ alone, there appear to be at least two codes, one being the header image of hieroglyphic-like characters, the other being a numerical code in the position of question and answer 11. The page called Summations appears to be one long cryptogram. The main page also has an audio file that is most likely an audio code, another audio code probably exists on the page titled 1 within the menu O, and a video audio puzzle is on 2 within O. That video puzzle takes you to a YouTube called Old Wolf, which seems to be more puzzles and art pieces, and is listed in the FAQ as one of the official pages connected to this project. A link to oldwolf.com is also at the bottom of the main website, and it takes you to another website with more puzzles that reminds me a little bit of 973 at Nama, which is not on this iceberg, but is another famous old internet mystery that involves cryptograms. I got pretty distracted on Old Wolf actually while researching this entry. It's a fun site to poke around, with full illustrations that hide secrets and the nostalgic find the link sort of ways to advance pages. In fact, if you get deep enough into it, you can find a page that offers a reward for an English translation of a several page PDF written in code. But returning back to Sotola, Vulturus Vulturus Volantis, most of the clear text is religious in nature and seems to draw on a variety of sources, though there are a few very, I guess mundane is the right word to describe some of the text subjects. Go check out FAQ question 12 and see a whole little rant on cryptocurrency and greed. In fact, there's a lot of salt in general scattered about throughout the FAQ, which I genuinely enjoyed reading and definitely gives this project more personality than others I've seen like it. You can also apply to join this project, which presumably grants you access to the locked pages on the site, which may have more interesting puzzles or may let you in on creating them. This is another entry that I would be interested in looking into further along with Old Wolf, but if you're looking for puzzles of the more internet mystery variety rather than traditional code breaking, you definitely want to check these two out. Rayburn Murder Cryptogram 
Taking a hard pivot away from internet mysteries, this one is related to true crime. In 2004, Linda Rayburn and her son Michael Berry were murdered by Linda's husband David Rayburn, who then committed suicide. Tragic, but not really much of a mystery, although that's always a good thing when it comes to crime. But a mystery does come in two years later, when someone claiming to be a friend of Linda's daughter Jen emailed cryptologist Bruce Schneier. This friend claimed to have been given a note by Jen, which was found amongst David's things and which was written in code. There are so many red flags and questions about this situation that I won't bother going into because it's true crime and I don't want to be disrespectful, but I'm sure I don't need to explain the multiple ways this sounds suspicious. But assuming that it is real and that this is a real mysterious message left by a murderer, there are two major questions. Why was it written in code and what does it say? The message is written in letters and symbols you could find on a standard QWERTY keyboard. Some are in horizontal lines and others vertical along the margins. Some letters are capitalized and others are lowercase, some underlined and some with a line to the center. A few of the letters appear to have corrections or addendums made to them in the form of smaller letters written below them, and some letters are enclosed in a box. A few theories have been proposed that this isn't actually a code at all, but a collection of passwords or other computer-related notes that aren't exactly codes, just shorthand. But if it is a code, as far as I can tell, it's still entirely unsolved. De Bosnie's cryptograms. In 1882, Elizabeth, or perhaps Betsy, I've seen both names, Wells, was found dead, and her husband of a few months, Henry de Bosnie's, was charged and convicted of her murder. In 1883, he was executed for the crime, though he maintained his innocence until his death. There are all sorts of strange things about this story, and I had actually heard of it for a completely unrelated reason, so if you want a weird case to look into, this is a good one. But it's on this iceberg specifically because de Bosnie's left behind four encrypted notes that have yet to be deciphered. The messages themselves are all of decent length except for the last one, which is much shorter. The characters are mostly non-letter symbols such as percent signs, brackets, and even a little anchor, though Roman and Greek letters appear along with Arabic numerals. One of the ciphers has a distinct portion written in Roman letters, which appears to be the initials H D D L M F and each of the letters has lines below it, akin to tally marks. De Bosnies was said to speak multiple languages, and the French message included on the same page as one of the ciphers is written in a way that indicates French is not his first language. He claimed to have been born in Portugal, so his native language might have been Portuguese, but that's speculation. A lot about this guy is speculation, and we can't really take anything he said as fact. There has been very little work done on these cryptograms, mostly because they seem to have been overlooked for a very long time, possibly even until the 2010 book The Adirondack Enigma by author Sherry Farnsworth. Rubin Cryptogram In 1953, Paul Rubin, a chemistry student at New York University, was found dead near the Philadelphia airport. Since every version of this story I looked at had different information, I won't go in depth on the crime side of things, but an investigation found that he had died of cyanide poisoning. Since he would have had access to cyanide as a student, this was considered a likely suicide, although some aspects of this mystery make it possible there were other people involved. But this case is on the iceberg because Reuben was found with a piece of paper taped to his abdomen, and that paper contained a message in code. The message is in numbers and Roman letters, with the first part being primarily nonsense words, and the second part being sets of zeros and ones broken up by periods and X's. Two readable words, duels and conant, put this case on the FBI's radar, because they were the names of a politician and diplomat, respectively. The FBI's case file is available on this subject. I haven't read it all since it was very long, but I read a good portion of it, and just the first few pages alone are a wild ride. It is so worth taking a look at. But as I understand, no link between the possible names and the note were ever really corroborated, and it may have been coincidence or they could have been used as code words. Rubin was apparently a fan of science fiction and of coded messages, and so it's likely he created a code for himself and possibly his friends. However, it's also possible the code means nothing, as there were some indications Rubin might have been suffering from a mental illness as he'd begun to display some unusual behavior, such as asking to be called by a new name that he'd given himself as an homage to a fictional detective. The cipher has never been solved, so if you're curious, it's definitely worth taking a look at. And again, if you're curious and have some time to kill, the FBI report is also very interesting. Hungarian Crossword Suicide There aren't a lot of details in this one, so it'll be sadly short and also just sad. In 1926, a man named Antal Gyula shot himself in the bathroom of a cafe in Budapest, Hungary. On his body was a blank crossword puzzle, as well as a note that claimed the reason for his suicide and the names of relevant people would be found in answers to the puzzle. Although references to this story have been found in contemporaneous newspaper articles, verifying that it probably did happen rather than just being an urban legend, there doesn't appear to be any copy of the crossword itself anywhere, nor has anyone solved it. Thaulus's Cryptograms Robert Thaulis was a psychologist with an interest in the paranormal. 
To conduct an experiment that would combine the two subjects, he decided in 1948 to create an enciphered message, publish it, and then never reveal the solution or the key. The idea was that, after his death, if it were possible to communicate with the other side, he could reveal the key and allow a medium to decode the message and therefore prove that they had spoken with the dead. Because only one message would produce only a single result, something which is not particularly scientific, Thaulis decided to publish two ciphers. That way the experiment could be repeated and it would lend a lot more rigor to the result. Unfortunately, one of the two ciphers was decoded by a code breaker, and so Thaulis had to publish a third. However, with the breaking of even one code, it proved that it was not necessary to receive a key from the dead in order to decipher the message. Still, when Thaulis died in 1984, the two remaining ciphers were still unsolved. That was until 1995, when computer scientist and cryptographer Jim Gologli, who was also the first person to publicly solve the first three cryptos cryptograms, solved the third cryptogram, which was encoded with a variation of the Playfair cipher, and used the keywords black and beauty. Playfair ciphers are a method of encoding text by creating a 5x5 grid that starts with a keyword and then is filled in with the remaining letters of the alphabet in order. Pairs of letters are then swapped with other pairs of letters based on their locations in the grid. Thales' version was similar, it was just much longer than 5x5, and it included two keywords as well as a few null letters. The second cryptogram is still unsolved and is not very long at only 74 letters. Since it relies on a keyword as part of Thales' experiment, that limits the types of cipher it could be, and it has the potential to be solved despite its short length if the key is either guessed or the enciphered text matched to a clear text source it might have been taken from, such as was done with the double column transposition challenge cipher. Ave Luxus Cipher Text the final entry is, fittingly, brought to us by the creator of this iceberg, Ave Lux Claritatis. This is a handwritten cipher, with the bulk of it written in symbols, although the title is written in Roman characters. As the titles of ciphers sometimes hold clues on how to solve them, it's important to not overlook it while analyzing this cipher. I haven't taken too much of a look at this cipher yet, though I admit I did consider trying to solve it before making this video, but considering I was once distracted for an entire week from my grad school homework by trying to solve a conlang, I knew better than to get involved before I had put this out. So, now that this video is going to be done, I'm going to give it a try, and I suggest anyone else who's interested to also take a shot at it. Aside from just the challenge of it, it supposedly contains instructions on how to receive a reward for solving it, so even better. And that's it! We've made it to the end of the iceberg, and I am so glad this ended up being the first iceberg I actually finished both researching and writing up. I learned so much, and I had such a good time doing so, and I hope everyone who's watched had a good time as well. Again, I'd like to thank Ave Lux Claritatis for their work in putting this iceberg together, and particularly for including links and little summaries of the entries. That helped a ton in making sure I was covering the correct subject for the entry. I'm not sure just yet what I'll be covering in my next video, but it'll likely be a standalone mystery or two. I'm definitely open to suggestions though, whether for standalone topics or other icebergs that you might find interesting, so please feel free to comment things you'd like to see. But yeah, that's it. I appreciate y'all, and I will hopefully see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.